before we get going, if you enjoy what we do on Spectator TV, then do subscribe to our YouTube channel. You do this by clicking the button at the bottom of the video and then tapping the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode ever again. And why not subscribe to The Spectator magazine too while you're at it? Get 12 weeks of the magazine for just £12 and we'll give you a free £20 Amazon voucher completely free. Uh, do the maths there. And that's three months of The Spectator delivered to your door and available online for just £12. Did we mention the voucher? Just go to spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer to take it up. Now to COVID. To the surprise of many, COVID cases across the UK are on the decline. Could the pandemic really be coming to an end? Have we reached herd immunity? Or are people just getting a little bit too excited too early? Professor Sinetra Gupta from the University of Oxford is on the show now. Sinetra, thanks for coming on. Ministers are taking hope from the fact there is now a clear downward trend in COVID cases. What do you think is behind it? And is this good news? Uh, well, I think the of course it's good news because um, w what it does is it start what it does is it allows us to start thinking about the different hypotheses about why cases go up or down at all and where we were at last year uh, was a situation where we didn't have enough data uh, naturally the the experiments hadn't been done to help us discriminate between two different hypotheses and that's where the battle has been um, over the last you know, year or so, is um, in trying to determine which of the two competing hypotheses is correct. And what I said you know, a year and a half ago now almost, was really that we should be extremely cautious about using mathematical models to predict the course of the um, pandemic and also to make policy decisions. Because what we have here now is from various countries, a rise and fall and uh, interesting epidemic pandemic patterns. And as I've said, there are two competing hypotheses about why these are happening. One is that they're entirely due to um, the effects of masks and lockdowns and other non-pharmaceutical interventions and we've seen a lot of models that have appeared to validate that but they don't actually what they do is they throw out a testable hypothesis about whether these things work or not on the other end of the spectrum we have uh, several uh, groups including our own saying that well actually we have to also consider the effects of uh, naturally acquired immunity, of herd immunity, of seasonality, and factors that are not related to uh, these uh, imposed restrictions. The truth, of course, lies somewhere in between, but both of these activities are actually just hypothesis generating activities. So you know that it could be the um, non pharmaceutical interventions, it could be herd immunity, seasonality, only data can tell us where we lie within that continuum. And our, what I would say now is we have, what we, we're seeing with the cases falling now, or this downward trend, is that the effects of these NPIs are limited and the main drivers are actually naturally acquired immunity in the population or to obviously now vaccine induced immunity uh, which is unfortunately probably quite transient, but it's there, the signature is there, and, and seasonality. And we've had a piece on Coffee Heads this week by Oliver Johnston, the statistician, and he has uh, ultimately said that it might be too early to celebrate or not, to, or in a way, don't get ahead of ourselves when it comes to making predictions in terms of the, uh, well, the third wave is over because it could in a way be peaks and troughs. And he's talking about a local maxim compared to a, a global one. Um, something we saw in Bolton where cases went down and then they went back up. So do you think this means it's too early to really know what's going on given that if we look at the 19th of July easing, that wouldn't necessarily feed in just yet? Uh, absolutely not. I think that what, what's happening here is you have, and, and something that's been ignored, is that there is a lot of 
uh, there are regional differences. So it, it makes absolutely, I agree with Oliver in that it doesn't make any sense to uh, make grand sweeping statements on the basis of countrywide data. So, you know, last year people were saying, oh, there's only 6% seropositivity in the country. And there are two things wrong with that. One is that they were not taking into account that antibody levels decline very rapidly after infection. And more uh, pertaining to the question you just asked, there is no point lumping together all the data from different regions. And our own work showed last year that while um, people may have been highly exposed in London, for example, it was clear that Scotland had not suffered the same level of exposure. Um, and probably lockdowns consolidated that. So yes, uh, and, and not surprisingly, that's where we saw infections creep up immediately as soon as restrictions started to be lifted. So it's not as complicated as people want to think it is now that they're very simple models only, including um, farm interventions and restrictions don't explain it. It is still simple, but it, it is a simple mix of herd immunity, seasonality, and some effect of these um, non-pharmaceutical interventions, as well as a transient effect of vaccine-induced immunity on blocking infection. Now, just to be clear, vaccine-induced immunity is fantastic and hopefully um, long, I mean, durable, lifelong, when it comes to protecting against severe disease and death. But I suspect some of the increase that we're see, seeing now is due to the waning of the infection blocking part of vaccine induced immunity. And I think one of the reasons it feels as though uh, many in Westminster, but also sci scientists and scientific advisors have been caught by surprise on the drop in daily cases we've seen in, in parts of the week, is that we've had quite bold predictions. So you had Professor Neil Ferguson, I think just around a week ago, saying it was almost certain to reach 100,000 cases a day, and there was a good chance actually you could even get to 200,000 a day. Now. They've dropped, uh, uh, you know, below 50. Uh, you know, we're looking at 20 something thousand a day in some cases. What do you think uh, has led that person to make such a bold prediction um, when that is not corresponding with the, what we're seeing now? As I've said over and over again, and, and my whole, um, you know, involvement in all of this from March of last year was to stress that models are absolutely crucial and invaluable as tools for generating testable hypotheses. They should never be used to predict and also policy, while they should be used as a basis for formulating policy, they should not there they should not be treated as truth in any sense. So what we have are different hypotheses. As I said, we've got a hypothesis that lockdowns work and everything uh, you know is is due all the uh, fluctuations we're seeing are due to these mandated um, restrictions and then on the other hand we have this other hypothesis that maybe they are due to natural immunity accruing in the population despite these restrictions and only data can tell us where the truth lies. I think the data right now are telling us that natural immunity, herd immunity plays an enormous role, a very important role in bringing down infection. And we've seen that over the world. I mean, uh, all over the world, there are places where uh, lockdowns are effectively impossible to implement. And we know that natural immunity plays can, even in those circumstances, bring infections down. Now, what of course we needed to do was recognize all of that and come up with a policy that was robust to all these uncertainties. And what we suggested last year, which was to focus protection on the vulnerable, would have done that. It would have avoided all the uncertainties um, that models have in, in terms of actually throwing out real numbers about how things are going to be. So what's happening now is not a surprise. Uh, there are different models, different hypotheses. The data are coming in. What we need to do now, instead of arguing, amongst ourselves is just to sit back and say, okay, which of the different competing hypotheses do these data support? 
it's a rational exercise that should be executed with calm and without this idea that there is some sort of conservation of virtue here and that someone just because someone was wrong or right when it came to the hypotheses that they are either a good or bad person. Do you think then that perhaps when we're having these debates and particularly uh, with COVID we're hearing more when it comes to these hypotheses, uh, you know, competing theories, um, that there is a responsibility, I suppose, to be, to be a little bit less certain in the language we use. Um, because it's interesting because overnight Nate Silver, so uh, the famous US uh, pollster uh, who has got many things in his right right in this time, but also something's wrong, has been quite critical of Neil Ferguson's language, uh, saying that uh, you shouldn't have a situation where someone is uh, so uh, keen to say that they're definite when you're doing uh, predictions, um, just because it is such a complicated thing to do. It's not, it's not complicated, it's just that there is a confusion between hypothesis and prediction. Uh, the models that Neil and, and uh, all the, the so-called mainstream um, com modelling community were producing were all um, generally self-consistent hypotheses about how uh, mandated NPIs might bring down infection. So they, in those models they uh, assumed that closing schools would have some effect and then they fed it into the model and they showed that that could indeed explain uh, some of the patterns that uh, they had that were, had been observed up to, that, up to that point. So what they actually were doing were producing a self-consistent, testable hypotheses. Now, where that went wrong and people started treating them as uh, predictions, I don't know, and it's not for me to assign blame on that. But it was not right. That's not part of the scientific procedure. What they should always have been presented as were testable hypotheses. Uh, as indeed on our side, saying that, look, uh, we think that actually a lot of this is due to uh, the accumulation of herd immunity and seasonality, that too is a hypothesis. So what we need to do now is all sit back and just say, uh, let's wait for the data to come in, and then we can decide which of these um, is more likely to be correct. And in the meantime, we need to follow policies that are robust, as I said, to these uncertainties and also are cognizant of the huge harm done by um, such measures as lockdown. And, and these, th these are all simple precepts. Uh, I think people are falling back upon, oh, this is all very complex, we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, we knew that. You'd never use models to make specific predictions. You use them to generate testable hypotheses. Uh, they did that, we did that, now let's wait and see what the data say.